week about how the Tories in England have reclassified grouse to make it possible to shoot, breed, shoot and sell, minimising your tax and maximising your government revenue at every possible stage. I really highly recommend this article. It's one of those things you read it and think, what sort of world have you got into? Because the age of entitlement is going absolutely strong and it's the top end of the income strata that's getting that entitlement, not the bottom end. Yeah, that's what's really going on. It, it's quite remarkable. I mean, I was, I'm, I'm rarely floored by an article because it's, you wouldn't make this stuff up. It starts off that <laughs> when you breed the grouse, it's a commercial animal. So you get these subsidies for breeding the grouse. Then when you shoot it, it's a wild animal. Okay? <laughs> but it actually transmutes about five or six times during its lifetime uh, to benefit whoever's shooting at it rather than uh, you know, the grouse itself clearly. So it, it, it's, it's a remarkable document. I really highly recommend that, have a read of that particular thing by George. So the age of entitlement is not over, it's going strong. The people are being titled at the very upper echelons of the income distribution. And most recently that's been confirmed by a book which is being heralded by, even by conventional economists now, by a guy called Piketty, a French economist. I'm reading it right now quite slowly. Um, I won't get through it, I think, until I come back from the, my next uh, talking engagement somewhere else on the planet. But it is very methodical. It's certainly it's, it's worth reading because it's based on empirical data. And that is one thing economics has avoided like the plague, is basing itself on empirical data. Now, I'm delighted that he's doing it. I'm not too worried about the theoretical context, at least finally looking at empirical data. And in his opinion, and it's not opinion, it's, 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 it's fact in this sense, given the research that's gone into it, we're living in a more unequal time now than the Gilded Age. This is the most unequal time in human history. So to say the age of entitlement is over is a complete distortion of the issue of entitlement. It's the top that gets entitled. It's the age of sharing that's over. Now I want to talk about the economics of that. And uh, I'm going to hit you with a bit of modelling here, which is going to be turning up in my business spectator column. Before I do that, I'll, I'll just give a bit of a... If we've got an ACOS ad beforehand, so I'll give you an ad for me as well. Uh, if you want to read what I normally write, you can find me on Business Spectator, which is an online magazine. Uh, part of uh, News Limited, and um, my column uh, is published each week, and the current one is on this whole issue of should we run a surplus. So what I'm going to take you through is a, what I'm going to be talking about in next week's column is a, a bit of modelling here. I've, I've gone through and shown uh, that if you look at the, the, the tone of the, the language in, the, in this National Commission of Audit, so at the, notice, the top of the notice you can actually see the text, I'll make it a bit larger so you can see it. Okay, I think you can you see it now, can't you? Bits for those at the back, please. Pardon? Could you read bits yeah, I will, I back. will. It's going to make it larger as well so you can see it too. It says, live within your means. Okay? And it continues to say something I quite agree with. All government spending should be assessed on the basis of its long term cost and effectiveness and the sustainability of finances. Fair enough. Okay? But live within your means. So that's seeing, a, you know, if you like, the government like a household. Yeah. You don't want to spend more than you earn. And the next one says, for, strong, for governments as for companies, a strong balance sheet is essential, important. Now, a strong balance sheet, uh, I stuffed up when I first wrote part of this paper. You, being a journalist, you write a bit too rapidly these days compared to academic publishing cycles. So a little, little uh, type, uh, uh, double negative get through the wrong way. But if you take a look at your assets and your liabilities, you want the gap between the two to be positive. So if you actually say, well, what's my net debt? If you're actually like a company that's got net positive equity, your net debt's negative. Okay, so you want to have a negative. If you say, what are my debts to the world? It's minus a certain amount of money. And that's a prudent role for a company. It means it's got positive net assets, positive, positive equity, uh, and therefore it's well and truly above being bankrupt. Now this implies that a government should be the same way. The government should attempt to have negative net debt. Well, how many countries actually achieve that? This is in my current column, so you can take a look at it. The answer is 12 have negative net debt. That's the list there. The top one is Norway. Next is Libya. United Arab Emirates. Saudi Arabia. Can anybody notice a pattern here? <laughs> okay. Oil exporters. Okay. Uh, you then get Finland, Algeria, Sweden, Kazakhstan, Borat lives, Bulgaria, Liberia, Chile and Lesotho. Obviously countries we wish to emulate, correct? 
well, you know, we can't find the oil, it's, it's become like Lesotho instead. When you look in the opposite direction and say, well, just how bad is Australia's debt level? The answer is right now we have a, debt, a net government debt level of 14% of GDP. Now, from a business analogy, we're already bankrupt, and I want to come back to whether that's a sensible analogy or not. But we're not as bankrupt as everybody else on that scale, because if you take a look at what the debt levels are around the world, who tops the list there? Well, of course, it's Greece, courtesy of its wonderful management under the uh, European Union. 158%. Next is, I'll say, actually, that's that should be you know, 155. Then net just debt for Japan, because Japan has many assets overseas. 134. Lebanon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have to go down a hell of a long way before you find an absolute basket case of an economy called Germany that has a net debt level six times the level we currently have. Okay. So something is wrong with the analysis if it says we should be having a lower net devil, the debt level. If you take a look at the tone of the language in the, in the audit document, what it basically says is if we don't fix things up now, right now, then in 10 years' time, our debt level is going to be 16% of GDP. Now, I really want to see one of these guys deliver this at an international forum because they say, we're panicking at 16%. I says, it's a bit like uh, being in a car and you're doing 15 kilometres an hour. Somebody says, slow down, you're going to hit the speed limit. It's 110, mate. <laughs> you know, I'm still getting up there. So that, that level alone is something that's slightly awry. But I want to go and take a look at the actual logic of should we be running a surplus? And to try to answer this, as my good mate Frank still I noticed in the audience over there knows, economists use models. And I normally knock the models that economists uh, use, and I'll show you why. I've got a beautiful quote down here in a while, because a large part of the argument that we should uh, run uh, during, the, during the crisis now, a lot of economists, conventional economists, more to the right of, well, to the right of Genghis Khan, but also to the right of Paul Krugman, uh, would say that if you had a, a government running a, a surplus now, that would stimulate public spend, the spending by the, by the uh, private individuals. And the logic for that is the sort of thing which you think, you know, you can't make this up again. Uh, there's the statement. This is by a guy called, who's really developed a lot of the tools conventional economists use to do their model called Robert Barrow. His logic as to why a government running a, a surplus now, so taking money out of the economy, higher taxes than revenue, why that would stimulate spending. The reason is, he assumes the existence of, and I quote, a network of intergenerational transfers, which makes the typical person part of an extended family that goes on indefinitely. In this settings, households capitalise the entire array of expected future taxes and therefore plan effectively with an infinite horizon. Yeah, as I said in the article, if that sounds like delusional bullshit to you, that's because it is. Okay. But that's the basis of their modelling. And I see it's, it's a bit like putting an invisible rabbit, uh, sorry, imaginary rabbit inside an imaginary hat and pulling out with an imaginary invisible line and expecting applause from the audience. Okay? That's typical economic modelling, which I'm doing my best to undermine. On that front, by the way, my book called Debunking Economics, which just goes in and reads aloud the dirty bits from economic literature to show how insane what often gets sanitised in textbooks actually is. But I'm working on a different approach to modelling, and that's trying to build realistic model of the economy modelling the monetary flows that exist in the actual economy. This is a model I put together uh, which initially was looking at why banks matter in economics because again one thing you might not realise unless you've been suffered through an economics degree is that economists believe they can model the economy and ignore the existence of banks, debt and money. <laughs> I'm not joking, I wish I was. You know? That's about saying I can model how a bird flies by ignoring it has wings. You know? So that's what they do. Well I said that's garbage, we have to build a way of modelling and keeping banks, debt and money in the system, which is what I've done here. And what I've done is add into it the fact that, as well as banks creating money by creating loans, the government running a deficit also injects money into the economy by running a surplus that takes it out. So I've put a very simple little system in here, adding into this model of where, 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 where the private banks create money by creating loans and cause the, the, just the money we spend to come into existence. I've added the thing, well, the government also taxes and the government also spends. Very, very simple. So I've just got government spending and government taxation, both set at the moment on this model at the same percentage of GDP. So if I run this model, and I'll run it slowly and talk through what's going on, there's a lot of simulation elements I'm not showing on the screen, the screen's not big enough. But if you run it, what you get is a rising level of GDP over time. You can see the 
line at the top there going up, the GDP is rising, government deficit, there's no deficit at all, and if government debt started at, say, 50% of GDP, which is what it is here, it's tapering down towards zero in the, over, over the longer term. That's what a budget, the balanced budget does. Now, what I want to see is, well, let's see what happens if you actually run a surplus instead. Okay? Because the conventional picture is, well, running a balanced budget is good, but running a surplus is better, because if you look at what they're trying to reach by 2024, they want to have a 1% of GDP budget surplus. And that the government, the, the picture there is of, of like a, a, a family spending 1% less than it earns, so it's saving up lots of money that it can put aside in case a bad day comes along. Or a corporation doing the same thing. You know, I think Apple and Microsoft have got a few dollars to spare in case anything goes wrong with their companies. So that sort of thing. You're putting aside a buffer. And that's the analogy that really dominates how all conventional economists, not all, a large number of conventional economists think, and certainly our politicians think. That's the rhetoric they go into. So I'm going to now drop the level of, of spending by 1% of GDP. So we now have taxation being 24% of GDP, but government spending being 23%. So you're running at this permanent 1% surplus. Well, let's watch what happens here, and then I'll talk you through it. Well, everything going along fine. Up there, there's our surplus fan. Test what's happening to GDP. Oh dear. We're heading back down towards zero again. And you actually get there. So you run a nice old surplus. You've got a, a positive, you get negative net debt. So you've got that, that your, you know, your assets exceed your liabilities. On this side, the government looks great. The economy's tanked. What's going on? What's actually going on is there are two ways that money can be created in a market economy. The government can run a deficit or the banks can extend more loans than they get back in repayments. Now, if you say the government's going to run a surplus all the time, then rather than creating money, it's taking money out of the system. And it continues taking the money out of the system, so the amount of money actually falls, unless we are saved by the banks coming to the rescue. And we all know that banks do really sensible things when they lend money, don't they? Okay. So I can actually balance this out by saying, well, let's actually have a higher rate of, a faster rate of lending by the banks and a slower rate of repayment and see what happens. I'm just going to go down a bit here and show you what's happened in this model to the level of private debt. Actually, I hope I've got that in this particular... No, I didn't change this particular version of the system. Oh, dear. Hang on a second. But in this, I'll talk about this in next week's column, which is coming out on Monday, I believe. Um, so you, you've got running a surplus causes an economic crisis. What actually happens is the private sector ends up borrowing, borrowing more money from the banking sector, but the economy is collapsing at the same time. So you get ultimately a blowout in private debt. Government debt looks great, but there's a blowout in private debt, and the GDP collapses because you're taking money out of circulation. Now I've changed it here to have the banks lending more money. And if I do that and put it right, then I get rising GDP. Okay, all looking all fine. But we know what the banks lent money to do with that last time around, don't we? The subprime bubble, the dot-com bubble before that. They, the banks, the easiest way to make money is to cause a Ponzi scheme. And a large part of the crisis we went through was the banks doing precisely that and the government coming in and running a deficit in response to the decline in the rate of borrowing by private individuals. So it's insane to run a permanent surplus. This is the outcome. You will take money out of the economy. And when you look at what happened under Howard in Australia and under Clinton in America, and therefore I'm being completely even-handed, right and left, you know, they're both the same because they believe the same nonsense theory, they both ran surpluses. And they thought they were doing great economic management. And then 15 years, 10, 10 or so years later, the economy falls over. Now, I think the surpluses weren't necessarily uh, what caused rising private debt, but rising private debt enabled the government to run a surplus and look like it was doing sensible economic management. Okay. What instead it was doing was setting up for the sort of financial crisis we've been through so far. Now, what happens if you go the other way and you run a permanent deficit? So I've actually gone to permanent deficit and I'm going to put the lending of what the, the rate of lending by the banks back to the same level. And what you get is a GDP that goes on rising because what you have is the banks are creating money by lending more than repayments and the government's creating money by running a deficit permanently 
Now that might be distributed to some part of the inflation, but other parts of the real economic growth. And you go on indefinitely and you find your government debt stabilises, doesn't blow out. So one of the roles of government debt is the creation of money we use for spending. And that's why they're using uh, either a business or a, or a household as the analogy for how a government should behave is the wrong analogy. Because we, the, the analogy is with a bank. Because banks create the money that we use for transactions by creating loans, and government creates the money we use for transactions by running a deficit. And therefore there's a reason in a growing economy to have both deficits being a permanent feature of the economy, except during an absolute boom, which you might want to cut off with a higher level of tax, uh, and lending as well. And you want, to, you want lending to go to responsible activities rather than the Ponzi schemes that banks and, and financial systems get into instead. So we need a sensible analogy, and making the analogy of the government to households, or in this particular case corporations, is the wrong analogy. And that's what we need to get through to our politicians in Canberra. And I hope you'll help me do that. Thank you. Thank you.